and welcome to the third video of your scheme of work. So this video will start by looking at the chapter The Great Mouse Plot and also at Mr. Coombs. So our learning objective for this lesson is to introduce the concept of structure. Now in English, particularly when you're in year seven, maybe year eight, we focus a lot on language and we develop your skills of language analysis. But it's really important when you get to GCSE to think also about structure alongside language. So for that reason, we're going to start thinking about structure as in, a, in the most basic form in year seven and then work your way up to structure in in depth when we come to GCSE so if you're thinking at the moment like what is miss talking about when she mentioned structure don't worry because that will become clear as the video goes on now as always you need your work booklet for this lesson so work booklet looking at lessons seven to nine and also a copy of boy so whether that's your physical copy of the book whether that's the PDF or the audio book that can be found on YouTube so if you haven't got those things then please go to um, pause the video and go and find yourself your copy and also your work booklet now, as I mentioned, then, just like language, writers also use structure to create effects in their writing. The most basic definition of structure is the order of ideas and why. So when a writer is putting together a piece of work, like Roald Dahl, for example, he puts his work in a particular order for a reason. Now, in his autobiography, it starts with him before he was born even, it starts thinking about his parents and the lives of his parents, and then it goes through chronologically, meaning um, in a time sequence in order of time, and it ends with him being 20 years old. Now, he could have started his novel with him at 20 years old and then going back and going back each year, but he's chosen to start before his parents were before he was born, when his parents were young, and then he's developed it from there. So structure is the order idea of ideas and why they've been put in that order. Now, as I mentioned a few lessons ago, we have writer's methods and writer's methods can be language methods or they can be structure methods. I'm going to talk about some structure methods in this lesson. Now, obviously, you don't need to copy them because um, they are on the PowerPoint slides and they are also in your work booklet. We're going to look at three key words in this lesson. And the first of those three key words is the word Victor. Now, you, those of you that have seen the Hunger Games or you've read the Hunger Games books, you might be very familiar with this word because a victor is a winner, is someone who is successful at something. OK, some of you, I'm sure, have, could describe yourself as victors in certain cases. Maybe you've been a victor during a football match or maybe you've been a victor um, during a spelling bee. So a victor Victor is a winner, is someone that's successful. As opposed to that is a villain, and you definitely should know what a villain is. A villain is a bad person. So in Harry Potter, the villain is Lord Voldemort. In Hunger Games, as I mentioned, the villain is President Snow. And then finally, we've got the word a victim, and a victim is somebody who suffers. Now, throughout the chapters that we're going to look at today, we come across three different types of characters. We come, ac come across victors, villains, and victims, but they aren't always just one of those. Sometimes they can be more than one. And as you'll realise, the roles change. So somebody who starts off being a victor ends up being a villain or even a victim as the chapters go on. Now, what we're going to do now is you're going to read chapters four and five. So not just chapter four, but chapter five as well. And you're going to be focusing on this question. So how do the roles of victor, villain and victim, how do they change as the chapters progress? So as I mentioned just a minute ago, the victor isn't the victor all the way through the chapter, nor is the villain, nor is the victim. So I want you to think about how these roles change. So pause this video, read chapters four and five, see if you can identify as the chapters develop who the victim Victim, the victor and the villain and this all sound really similar who the victor the villain and the victim who they are and how they change as the chapter goes on so pause the video and read chapters four and five now, you've read the chapters and you'll notice in your workbook that you've got a table that's got each of these events from the chapters on it. Now, for each event, you need to decide which character or characters are in the role of victor, vic villain and victim. Now, some of them might be more than one and you might have more than one character for each of those. So you need to decide the boys, Mrs. Pratchett and the headmaster, are they victims, are they villains or are they victors during the chapter? So the first event is the boys find the dead mouse and decide to play the prank on Mrs. Pratchett. So have a think. Are they victors here? Are they successful? Are they villains or are they um, suffering? So you need to decide how would you describe the boys in that, that event when they find the dead mouse and they decide to play the prank on Mrs. Pratchett. 
The second event is when Roald Dahl puts the mouse in the gobstopper jar. So go back to that part if you're not sure in the book and figure out how does he feel at that point. Does he feel like a victor? Does he feel like a villain? Does he feel like a victim? The third thing is when Mrs Pratchett's shop is closed and the boys think she might be dead. Now, obviously, you've read the chapter, you know that she isn't actually dead. But in that moment in time, what is Mrs Pratchett? Is she a villain or is she a victim or is she even a victor? So have a think in that moment of time when the boys walk past and Thwaites makes, he says, oh, she might have had a heart attack and died. How would you describe the boys at that point? Are the boys victors or do they feel like winners at that point or do they feel like villains? Then, number four, Mrs. Pratchett emerges on the playground with the headmaster. Now, when they see her, and Dahl immediately feels a little bit relieved because he thinks, oh, yes, she's not dead. But then he thinks, oh, no, what does this mean for me? So have a think there. Is, are the boys victors, villains or victims? Um, is Mrs. Pratchett a victor or a villain or a victim? And the headmaster as well. And then finally, Mrs. Pratchett identifies the boys to Mr. Coombs in the playground. And Mr. Coombs is the headmaster. What is his role here? What about um, Mrs. Pratchett? Pratchett what's her role I would say when she identifies the boys how does she feel is she really sad when she identifies them or does she feel successful that she's been able to identify them so on your table in your workbook let fill in those things do a tick for each one or you can you can change them as you go maybe the boys they start off as um, a victor maybe they end being victims it's up to you to decide now you're going to be doing a piece of writing that thinks about that you thinks about structure because as I said the roles aren't the same all the way through these two chapters the roles do change so I want you to focus just on the boys and if you want to extend your writing and if you want to try and challenge yourself you could do a similar paragraph based on Mrs Pratchett or based on the headmaster but if you're just doing the basics of what's on the slide I want you to focus just on the boys so that's Dahl, Thwaites and his friends and I want you to fill out these sentences and they're in your work booklet as well so at the beginning of the great mouse plot the boys are in the role of so you can look at your table what did you say they were are they victors are they villains or are they victims because how does how are they presented and why what happens that makes them seem that way and i want you to think this makes the reader think or feel are we excited at the beginning of the the great mouse plot that dar has come up with this plan then you're going to write however later their role changes to and how does the role change and why so why does it change what happens what makes it change and then lastly, at the end of the second chapter, so by second chapter, we mean at the end of the chapter about Mr. Coombs, their role is and then why is what is their role and why has it changed? And by doing that, you're thinking about structure. Now, you can see you've got some sentences or phrases that tell the teacher that is going to be looking at your work that you're talking about structure. So the idea at the beginning, if you're talking about the beginning, you're talking about the order of events. Then later, their role changes. That word later shows whoever's looking at your work that, you know, you're thinking about the order of the events. And then finally, at the end. So if I say at the end of this, I'm talking about structure because I'm showing that I'm thinking about the order of events and why they're putting that order. Now what's really important here is your because part of your sentences. You want to try and use as much detail as you can. So because um, the boys have done this, they are presented in this role. So you're not just thinking about the language that's used. You don't need to do any single word analysis. You don't need to think about um, adjectives or adverbs or verbs here. You're thinking about what role they're playing and why that role changes. And who is our sympathy with? Have a think about that question. At the beginning, who do we feel sympathetic for? Anybody? Are we excited for the boys? At the end of the chapter, who do we feel sympathy for? Maybe in the middle. Maybe do we even feel a little bit of sympathy for Mrs Pratchett when we think that she might be dead? So have a think about that and how that changes as the... Um, chapters develop okay now when you've done that and it, hopefully it took you a little bit of time it should have taken you 10 to 15 minutes at least I want you to think about a structure as a concept and I want you to have a look at this little picture now sometimes teachers use this little picture to help us get a rough idea of where you are and how you feel about a certain subject you might also be familiar with um, a rag system so red amber and green so or thumbs up thumbs down or thumbs to, in the middle to let us know how you're feeling so we need to have a think when it comes to your under understanding of structure so that's the order of ideas and why where would you place yourself on this chart are you going to be that guy in the middle who is at the top of the tree he's really happy he's cracked it he had no problems getting up there he can fully understands it are you going to be the guy that is sat with his back he's ha about halfway up but he's sat with his back to um 
the um, front of the picture. He doesn't want to be looking around. Maybe he's not really sure. Maybe he's halfway confident. Or are you going to be that person flat on the ground at the bottom of the picture, led down, that literally has no idea what Miss has been talking about this whole video? So I want you to have a think. And you've got a picture in your work booklet so you can circle which one you are. And I want you to think about why you're there. How do you feel about a structure as a concept? Now, as I said, we've looked at it in the very most basic terms this lesson. So by basic terms, I mean we've just looked at what the order of events are and why as you go through secondary school you'll start looking at the structure in a little bit more detail so are you clear that the roles change throughout these two chapters and are you clear as to why they change when you've done that you finish this lesson so you can either pause the lesson as it is um, and then resume tomorrow maybe the next day or you can just carry on through and start thinking about um, lesson eight so last lesson you read um, chapters four and five and you looked at um, the Great Mouse Plot and Mr. Coombs. So today we're going to be looking at the chapter Mrs. Pratchett's Revenge. And our learning objective is to consider where our sympathies lie at the end of the Great Mouse Plot. Now, just in case you're not sure, sympathy is how you feel about someone, whether you feel sorry for them, whether you feel happy for them, whether you feel sad for them. And sympathy and empathy are quite different. You might remember, you might have learnt before that empathy is when you put yourself in someone else's shoes, whereas sympathy is when you imagine what it feels like to be them. So you're thinking, how do you feel for them? So we need to have a think at the end of this chapter, The Great Mouse Plot, um, and at the end of Mrs. Pratchett's Revenge, who do we feel most sympathy for? Do we feel sympathy for Mrs. Pratchett or do we feel sympathy for the boys at the end of these chapters? So the boys have been identified and now they must be punished. So your task now is to read chapter six, Mrs. Pratchett's Revenge. So I want you to use either the audiobook or your PDF or your copy of Boy and read chapter six, Mrs. Pratchett's Revenge. Pause this video now so that you can read that chapter. So at the end of this chapter, Mrs. Dull, and that's Sophie Magdalene, goes to see Mr. Coombe about the caning. So as you um, know, um, Roald Dahl is punished and his friends, they're punished using a cane um, and they're punished for planting the dead mouse in the gobstopper jar. And so they get a real thrashing from Mr. Coombs, who really seems to enjoy it. And in particular, the person that enjoys it the most is Mrs. Pratchett, who sits and watches the caning. So you're going to think about um, at the end of the chapter, Mrs. Dahl, she's giving Roald a bath. Don't forget, he's very young at this point, And she sees the marks on his body that Mr. Coombs has left with his cane. And she is furious about this. So she goes to see Mr. Coombs about the caning but we never actually know what is said between them. So your first task is to write a script of the conversation between Mrs. Dahl and Mr. Coombs. So I want you to think, maybe she knocks on Mr. Coombs' door and he would obviously seem quite surprised to see her to start with. Um, how does she react to the caning? What, how does she feel about Mr. Coombs caning her son? How does she feel about the marks on her son? So you might need to reread the end of the chapter to remind yourself how she feels about it and think about what is her opinion of physical punishment physical punishment like the caning that has happened um, to Dahl and his friends. So she is obviously not happy about it, hence the fact that she goes to see Mr. Combs. So how does she feel about that? So um, if you aren't sure, um, on page 58 in my copy, um, she actually says to Dahl, uh, to Roll, she says, they don't beat small children like that where I come from. I won't allow it. And she, um, Dahl says to his mother, what did Mr. Combs say to you, Mama? And she says, he told me that I was a foreigner and I don't understand how British schools were run. She said, did he get ratty with you? Very ratty, she said. He told me that if I didn't like his methods, I could take you away. And actually, that's what she decides to do. So I want you to have a think. You're going to write a script of the conversation between Mrs. Dahl and Mr. Coombs. But I want you to remember that Mrs. Dahl is a widowed single mother to six children. And she's a foreigner as well. So she's from Norway. And that's what Mr. De Coombs uses against her. He says, you don't understand how British schools are run. English schools, we have the cane at English schools. If you don't like it, take um, your son somewhere else. And so she's not in a position of power here, but she still tries to argue anyway. So I want you to think, um, what would happen? How would Mr. Coombs react to Mrs. Dahl? What would she say? Why would she say that it's not right to cane small boys? And what defence would Mr. Coombs use against her? So pause this video. That should take you about 15 minutes to complete. Um, try and think about the scene. How, what would it be like to be there? And why does Mrs. Dahl eventually leave? What does she say? So she agrees that she's going to take Roald out of school as soon as the term ends.
Okay, now it's very easy for us to dislike Mrs. Pratchett as we only see a tiny aspect to her character. And let's not think, forget about perspective here. The story has been written from Raoul Dahl's perspective. And so obviously to him, Mrs. Pratchett is the most disgusting, horrible, vile woman in the world. But we're only seeing one side of her. And actually, the real Mrs. Pratchett was a more tragic character who had a lot in common with Mrs. Dahl. So you will know at this stage of the um, autobiography that Mrs. Dahl's husband died, one of her children died, and that she's now a widow, a widowed mother of six. So she's looking after her husband's children from previous marriage. And she's also um, a foreigner. So she's not actually English herself, but she's living in um, Wales and she doesn't speak very good English. So the real Mrs. Pratchett was a more tragic character who actually had more in common with Mrs. Dahl. So we're going to read the article on the next few slides that is about the real Mrs. Pratchett. And this a copy of the article is in your workbook booklet as well. So if you can read it and you can annotate over it if you would like to. So the real Mrs. Pratchett, Landaff in the 1920s. Roald Dahl's run in with her and a, and a dead mouse as a boy inspired some of his most horrible characters. But who was the infamous Mrs. Pratchett and what became of her? Now, you might know that word infamous means to be famous for the wrong reasons. And that's how Dahl um, presents Mrs. Pratchett. She's very well known in the area and she's very well known to children who've read um, Boy Now, but she's famous for the wrong reasons. The image of her grubby fingers reaching into a sweet jar have disgusted generations of children. But of course, Mrs. Pratchett wasn't her real name. Her real name, we believe, was Katie Morgan. Mrs. Morgan ran it with her daughters, who were elderly spinsters. They lived in reduced circumstances. Running a little sweet shop was a means of bringing some money in. Widow Catherine Morgan and her daughters Kate and Sarah ran the shop for 37 years. Despite the delights on offer in the shop, Mrs Morgan was not the most welcoming shopkeeper. Dahl and his friends hated her so much they targeted her with the great mouse prop. The schoolboy's friends distracted Mrs Morgan, 68 years old at the time, so he could sneak a dead mouse into a glass jar filled with gobsotters. What happened in her life to make Mrs Morgan such a loathsome and malicious character? She was born Catherine Lound, who married master shoemaker Robert Morgan in Landalf Cathedral in 1875. The city's high street was a dirt road then, with tumble down thatched cottages on one side and hoardings on the other. The couple had three daughters, although one of them died in 1878, aged just seven months old. Soon after the death of their daughter, Mr Morgan died, although the circumstances of his death are unclear, leaving his widow a 26-year-old single mother of two. She tried her hand at dressmaking to try and make ends meet before opening Catherine Morgan confectioner and tobacconist in around 1900. Mrs Morgan and her daughters lived on top of the shop with a steady rotation of lodgers renting rooms. In sharp contrast, Roald Dahl was born on the 13th of September 1916 in a five-bedroom house built by his Norwegian father, Harold Dahl. His large Landalf house sat in half an acre, with later owners installing a tennis court in the back garden. While Dahl went on to become a world-renowned children's author, the sweet shop owner of his childhood remained in his hometown, becoming more and more reclusive. She finally died in the flat above the shop she had lived in for 64 years of sen senility, low blood pressure and bronchitis in 1939, aged 84. She is buried with her two daughters, who never married, in an unmarked grave just 200 metres, or 656 feet, from her former sweet shop. Just, but despite her anonymous death, the impression she left on Dahl remained. Okay, so you can see there's a really big difference there between the lives of Roald Dahl and, he, and uh, the fact that he grew up in a really huge house with lots of family members and the real Mrs. Patchett, um, Catherine Morgan. And you can see that actually Catherine Morgan has a lot in common with Mrs. Dahl. So the fact that Mrs. Dahl lost her husband and a child when she was really young and therefore was a single mother, just like the real um, Mrs. Patchett, Catherine Morgan. So I want you to have a think about this question. Who would you say you feel the most sympathy for? So do you feel lots of sympathy for Roald Dahl at this point? Do you think it's fair that he wrote this story about Mrs. Pratchett and presented her in this really horrible way? Do you feel sympathy for the real Mrs. Pratchett, Catherine Morgan? Do you think that maybe she had quite a hard life and therefore you can't blame her for being quite horrible and gruesome? Or do you think that actually doesn't 
um, account for the fact that she's so horrible to style? Do you think that she should have actually, um, despite what happened to her, have been a lot nicer to the children that came into her shop? Or do you feel most sympathy for Mrs. Dahl? So as I mentioned earlier, she had six children to look after. She was a single mother. She was a foreigner in Wales. She didn't speak very good English at the time. So I want you to think about that question. Who do you, would you say you feel the most sympathy for and why? So you've got space in your workbook. Let's answer it. Um, I want you to write down your answer. Try and give as much detail as you can. Perhaps if you want to challenge yourself, you could say which character you feel the least sympathy for as well. So maybe you feel the most sympathy for for. Catherine Morgan, maybe for the least sympathy for Roald Dahl, maybe Mrs. Dahl is somewhere in between. So it's up to you to decide. Okay, and then finally, we've got um, the next slide talks a little bit about the real life um, Mrs. Pratchett sweet shop. So you can see there's a picture on this slide of the lovely Mrs. Allen at the sweet shop in Landalf in Cardiff. So Roald Dahl's house, school and the sweet shop are all within walking distance of each other. And Mrs. Allen actually went there last spring, hence the picture. So um, outside the sweet shop, there is one of these blue plaques and we have them all around the UK. You might have seen one before that um, symbolise some a place that's associated with a literary person. So in this case, it's Dahl literary meaning literature if there's somebody that is famous for their literature there will be a blue plaque put up um, in that place just to so that we can remember what they were famous for and the fact that they are associated with that place in some way so it says Roald Dahl author born 1916 in Landaff died 1990 site of Mrs Pratchett's sweet shop during his time at cathedral school as recalled in his autobiography boy so that's the sweet shop and you can see that I don't think it looks like a sweet shop anymore but um, th there's that plaque there to remember the fact that this is the site that uh, he refers to in the novel Boy. So that's it for today's lesson. Obviously up to you if you want to keep going and you want to carry on through to the video, end of the video. But if not, pause it here and then you can resume next time you do your English lesson. OK, next lesson, then we are looking at school punishment. So you remember from the last chapter that we read that when Roald Dahl was at school, punishments involved the cane. So Mr. Coombs wasn't particularly shy about using the cane on Roald Dahl and his friends. And actually, later on in the novel, we find out that there are even more instances of physical capital punishment, we call it, in schools. So our learning objective is to understand and explore the issue of school punishments. So we're going to be looking at different types of punishments used against children um, in the early 1900s. So at the end of the last part of the autobiography, Roald Dahl was caned for his part in the Great Mouse Pot. So I want you to have a think. In your opinion, did he deserve it? Did he deserve to be caned? So I want you to write your answer out in your work booklet. Um, try and give as much detail as you can. Do you think he should have been caned? If not, how do you think he should have been punished? I want you to answer that in as much detail as you can. Did he deserve the cane? Okay, now in 2011, there were a spate of riots in London. After these riots, the public blamed a lack of discipline in schools, despite the fact that the riots happened in August. So you might um, remember these riots, you would have been very, very young. But I want you to try and have a think. These riots, there's a picture on the slide as well. So that lots of people after these riots, they blamed the fact that there was a lack of discipline in schools and that was the reason. And following those riots, an article came out and it was titled Bring Back the Cane. So as you can imagine, it was a very controversial article. So we're going to read the article in this lesson and we're going to see if you, if you agree that the cane should be brought back. And if not, how do you think, what do you think about punishments in schools at the moment? Are they harsh enough or not harsh enough? So hopefully you've read the article and if you haven't then pause this video where it is and read the article it's in your work booklet in its entirety so you can go and have a look at that and read the article now having read the article I'd like you to answer the following questions to check your understanding and they are in your work booklet so you don't have to write the questions out you just need to answer them and the first one says using a direct quotation what type of behavior do 49 percent of parents believe should result in physical punishment so have a look in the article use a direct quotation what type of behavior do 49 percent of parents believe should result in physical punishment Number two, what do 53% of parents and 77% of children want teachers to have? So have a think about that question. 53% of parents and 77% of children want teachers to have what? You can see this article's got lots of statistics in it and we spoke about that a few lessons ago. Statistics being percentages, um, being numbers that are used in an article. Number three, when did state schools stop using the cane? And again, I mentioned a few lessons what it means by state. A state is a government run. So the state is the government. When did state schools stop using the cane? 
number four, what is still the most popular method of punishment in schools? So have a think about that. Have a look at the article. The article will tell you what is still the most popular method of punishment in schools. And then finally, number five, according to 85% of parents, what do teachers have less of nowadays? What are teachers lacking? What do they have less of according to 85% of parents? So pause the video and answer those questions in your work booklet. Okay, so the answers then. So number one is very bad behaviour. You can give yourself a ticker across if you got that right. Number two, more power to crack down on bad behaviour. Number three, 1987 is when um, state schools stop using the cane. Number four, sending students out of lessons. That's still the most popular um, use of punishment. Maybe you might have had experience of that yourself being sent out of a lesson. And then number five was that parents believe that teachers have less respect from pupils than they used to. So maybe they're thinking about their own time of being at school. Did they have more or less respect from their teachers? Okay, now you've got a little this extract printed out in your work booklet, so you don't need to write it out. Um, you, but I want you to have a think. There are um, these words that have been underlined or labelled. So I'm going to read the extract out to you, and then I want you to have a think. What three techniques are used in this extract at the points that I mentioned? So. Parents and students know we have to give teachers more authority. Strong discipline is vital for effective teaching. In some of our most challenging areas, there are profound problems, so you need to think about what technique that is, as the events of last month underlined. That's why we need to give teachers more power to keep order and emphasis that adult authority should be respected and teachers obeyed. Every child deserves to be taught properly. This right is currently undermined by the twisting of rights by a minority who needs to be taught an unambiguous lesson in who is boss. OK, so you've got three writers methods to see if you can figure out what they are. The first one is authority when it's used not at the beginning, but it's used later as well. The second one is the phrase profound problems. And the last one is the phrase the twisting of rights. So see if you can th figure out what three writers methods are used in that extract. Okay, now, in this scene from the film Kess, set in Barnsley, 1969, five of the boys are there because they have been pulled out of assembly for misbehaving. The youngest boy, nearest the door, is only there to deliver a message and hasn't been naughty at all. The man who plays Mr. Grice in this film was a real teacher and the caning that he gives the boys is also real. So have a look on YouTube. The link is up here. So, so if you haven't, if you can pause the video, then type in the link on YouTube, find the scene from Kess and watch it and see if you can... Um, notice the fact that the caning that the boys are receiving is real their reactions are real okay so this is going to help you with the next part of the lesson so pause the video type in that youtube link find the scene from the film obviously it's quite an old film now it's from 1969 it's set in 1969 sorry um so even at this point in 1969 capital punishment was being um given out so i want you to have a think um about can you tell that the caning that boys receive are real in this um clip from the film Okay, and finally, I'd like you to think about your view. So what is your view on school punishments? Do you think that they are too soft? Do you think that they are too harsh? What about the system at Braden? Would you change our current school system? So obviously, currently we have C1, C2, C3s. Do you think that that system is fair? Do you think that it should be changed in any way? Um, I often hear lots of people complain about the mobile phone policy. So do you think receiving an after school detention for, for having a mobile phone out in school, do you think that that's a fair system? So I'd like you to explain your view and consider both sides of the arguments. So are modern school punishments too soft or are they too harsh? And I'd like you to explain your answer in as much detail as you can. Maybe think about the other side. So maybe if you said that they're too harsh, how who might say that they're too soft? Might some people believe that they're too soft and why? I'm sure that if I asked my parents, they would say that punishments these days are much too soft because they would remember receiving um, a smack with a ruler or having a board eraser thrown at them, for example. So I want you to think about your view. Try and give as much detail as you can and perhaps share your view with some of your family members, maybe something you could have a talk about.